people where people just go for challenges. And I think we finished up with ecotourism. So today I want us to take up ecotourism and look at ecotourism just as a market segment in tourism, but to look at community-based ecotourism as well. So uh, in this lecture, we are going to have about two videos we're going to watch. And one is actually on Kenya, which have some discussions around, especially in Kenya, but more so really at the coast and see how can we, is there anything that we can do to, to, to make things better uh, at the coast? Or do we have any ideas of what we can do to really achieve a high status of ecotourism? We're also going to look at the principles that uh, guide ecotourism. And I think from one of the videos, we're going to look at the benefits of ecotourism. Please make sure you're writing notes because that is a part of learning. So they're not just for fun. It's for you to listen. If there is a gap in your notes, you know that you fill it up with what, all the information that you're getting from within the class hours and even without to, to, make your, to make your knowledge even more robust. So I'm going to start sharing now. Make sure you register yourself. If you haven't registered, make sure. I don't think anyone has for this class. Make sure you write your name and also make sure you write your name. So can everyone see the presentation? Can you all see the presentation? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start. We had already defined ecotourism, although we still define it again. But just uh, to start with, uh, it's good to note that ecotourism is a growing niche market. Niche just means it's just a special kind of thing that is developing just away from the mainstream or different from the mainstream uh, with the potential of being an important sustainable development tool. We are talking about sustainable development over and over and over again. But tourism may be actually a sustainable development tool. Uh, this market or this segment is worth billions of dollars in annual sales. So it is, it is a, it's a segment that is making money, is generating revenue revenue going to all sorts of people, maybe the local community, in terms of tax and everything. So, and this is a segment, it is not redundant, it is growing. Uh, it frequently operates quite uh, industry. And you may just be wondering, so special about ecotourism. Why, why is this so different from the other types of ecotourism? Last week, when we were looking at tourism, I asked you to, to discuss uh, that we face, and, and we named them we, right from moral degradation, sometimes disrespect of culture, uh, all the way also to the degradation of the environment. And uh, yeah, so many things. And at times uh, being the fact that uh, the general, the mainstream tourism 
Yes, it may generate a lot of money, but you may just see, find out that the beneficiaries are basically uh, the proprietors, the owners maybe of the hotels and everything. Maybe the, even their workers are from a different place. So the local community is basically left out. They have no say in that kind of thing. The issue of pollution, pollution, plastics uh, at the beach, uh, destruction of uh, if it's corals, all those things. So ecotourism tends to remove itself from all that and have a completely new angle and outlook which is very attractive to some people. So, ecotourists are particularly interested in wilderness uh, settings that look pristine, they're untouched, they're unpolluted. You know, it doesn't have to be in the bed, it can be anywhere. Uh, and according to the fifth conference of parties to the CBD, ecotourism has a unique role to play in educating travelers about the value of a healthy environment and biological diversity. By the way, most people who, who take a holiday and say, okay, I'm going for holiday, but uh, the kind that I'm going to do is actually ecotourism. Uh, for the man, most of the people are very well informed. They are aware of what they want. They, and not only are they aware, but they do something, either directly or indirectly, maybe to conserve the environment, to, to, to reach out to the communities, to uh, in sharing. Uh, in whatever resources there are. So most of these uh, people are very, very well educated, very, very informed. Uh, so these people care. They care about a healthy environment. They care about uh, biological diversity and everything. However, having painted it so well and so glorious, uh, we should always take precaution because if you're not careful, remember in most cases, maybe these people are going to those pristine places that are still very well protected. If there's no proper planning and management, um, it is possible for ecotourism development to threaten the very, very biological diversity that it hopes to protect. So when you have an ecotourism project, or venture for that. Very, very careful that you don't overdo it. Everything should be so well planned, so well balanced out, so that you still achieve your aims. You should not be driven by money. Oh, we have more people. Let's create room for them and everything. No, 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 no. You should keep to the standard. So let's look at the definitions of Ecotourism. In one, the International Ecotourism Society defined ecotourism as responsible travel to natural areas that conserve the environment and sustain the well-being of local people. So there is the word environment there. And there is the well-being of local people. Put those two things in mind as we continue along because they are so important to defining what ecotourism is. Uh, the IUCN, on the other hand, have also given a definition according to them uh, it's an environmentally responsible travel or visitation to relatively, relatively undisturbed areas. I think so far they're in sync with the, with the above definition uh, in order to enjoy and appreciate that promotes conservation 
has low negative environmental impact and provides for beneficially acting economic environmental, sorry, economic involvement of local population. I want you to look at, to, to note this, these words, because they are so, so important once you come to, once you come to ecotourism. You notice that in, more, in both cases, in both definitions, I have, I have highlighted the local people. Let's go to the third definition and then uh, we will come back to that. Oh, okay, fine. So from these two definitions, some words just spring up. Is the word environmentally responsible? That means you are conscious as a traveler. Sorry, sorry, sorry. As a traveler, as to where you're traveling. So without even being able, being told, you are looking at your impact on the environment. So whatever activities you're going to carry out, the first question you'll be asking yourself, is it environmentally sustainable? And for most tourists, if they find it's not, then they are ready to stop that activity. Uh, the other thing that I want you to look at, of course, is the word conservation. Okay. I can't see it there, but well, it's, a, it's a major one. But I want you to look at the socioeconomic involvement of local people, the local population. For ecotourism, local populations are so, so important. You cannot say or you cannot uh, talk about ecotourism when you're not addressing local population. In fact, most ecotourists you find them right there inside the villages. That's where they're staying. That's where they're carrying out their activities. That they're doing whatever it is they are doing. So ecotourism, as, as I said, this is a special segment uh, that is different from the mainstream ecotourism. So I said it is small but rapidly growing industry. And of course it's governed by market forces and regulations. Yeah, because there are regulations. You, you don't just wake up one day and say, oh, I'm doing ecotourism. No, 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 no. You have to be certified. Advertised as being equivalent to nature tourism in the industry. So remember those definitions and maybe you're also wondering how come these definitions are, seem so close. Some countries, companies, destinations have social environmental policies and programs while others do not. And this has led to confusion worldwide about the meaning of the term ecotourism as it's applied in the tourism in the now. Any Prime motivation is the observation and appreciation of natural features and cultural assets. Whereas in adventure tourism, it's rather the physical exercise and challenging situations in natural environment. So you can already see the difference between ecotourism and this other kind of tourism. Ecotourism will always look at culture, the people, the people, it cannot be far removed from the people. And that is actually what just separates it from the rest. Uh, for most people or for most organizations doing ecotourism, most of them are mostly small scale tourism, mostly individualized. So you have a small tour group of about 25 people. Most of the hotels with ecotourism have less than a hundred beds, very small that is, by small and medium sized company in natural areas. Ecotourism projects will only find them in natural areas and not nowhere else. Uh, it concentrates on leading 
and accommodating small groups in natural areas in an educational manner using interpretive materials and local specialist guides. One thing about ecotourism, even where the guests stay is mostly within maybe a village. Uh, they'd use maybe local workers, local guides, okay? There's a lot of education that takes place in ecotourism and the ecotourist goes there very prepared, very prepared. They don't go like, oh, I want to enjoy my holiday. They don't bother me. No, no, no. They know that at times they'd be called upon just to sit down and be educated about the environment and probably uh, that, is, that is mostly uh, what they receive in their welcome package. But okay, we're happy to have you. But this day and this day, we should sit down and be educated. This day and this day, we should go out to the forest to do something. And for an eco-tourist, all that is acceptable. Uh, most of them don't even want to be bothered. So just leave me alone. I want to do my thing. Just I came for holiday. So what are the rules of ecotourism? How did ecotourism actually come about? How do we find ourselves today talking about ecotourism? Now, ecotourism is highly rooted in the conservation movement. So probably that is where it came from. It started with conservation and maybe later people are like, okay, so if you are doing conservation, how will people benefit from this conservation? And maybe that's how they ended up suggesting ecotourism, that you can see conserve nature and have other people from elsewhere come and enjoy it just the way it is and make some money out of it. So it's a highly strategic source of revenue to natural areas that need protection. So it was found like a solution to a natural area where you know that you need to protect that area. And if you need to protect it, that means you need money. So how do you make money? You can use ecotourism. Come, they pay, and you plow that money back into protection. Uh, another a role, something that I didn't mention about it. I said it's uh, you have to be environmentally responsible, but most ecotourists are also ready to support conservation. That is mostly in within their uh, within the minds of those people that are doing ecotourism. Now, in Kenya, research in the 1970s demonstrated that. The economic benefits of wildlife tourism far surpassed hunting, which was based in Kenya in 1977. Uh, I think from the colonial up to 1977, in Kenya there was a lot of, and this was introduced by, by the colonialists, there was a lot of uh, hunting. They'd hunt for trophies, and that included elephants rhinos, leopards for their beautiful skin, and other trophies. And, and people used to make money out of this. And uh, I reached a point when uh, poaching started, there was a lot of illegal removal of animals from the, from the forest. Of course, those who are hunting had licenses. But people who did not have licenses also took advantage. Is that we saw decline in our wildlife. There was a lot of smuggling of these trophies, elephant tusks, rhino tusks, uh, leopard skins, you know, those, those. I think this forced the government to put a ban on, on uh, hunting. But of course, the argument was we, we've been providing money. When you pay licenses for hunting, we, we, we get the government. So what will happen if, we are, if you're not hunting? And I think that is when the issue of ecotourism, they started uh, discussing it and realizing, hey, 
probably there is another way out here. We can make money just from people coming to see wildlife and uh, giving hunting licenses. And I think that has not disappointed because if you organize your tourism well, people will just come see the animals pay and they leave the animals there for somebody else to come and see and the saluta continua. Okay. In the early 80s, research on rainforest diversity and, of, <clears throat> and the excesses of nature in documentaries. This has also been used. Documentaries, I think, have also really played a big role uh, in, in, in supporting ecotourism or encouraging people or, yeah, to think around uh, tourism. Uh, of course, before, like, never knew what was inside the in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, in the coral reefs in Kenya, in other countries. All this was a mystery. But when documentaries started um, documenting this and showing, and, and people got interested, and of course, uh, the themes I think were conservation. So you say, fine, I would like to go and see the place, stay there, but still maybe donate towards the conservation of that place and that kind of thing. So this was a, also another key thing that uh, play was uh, contributed to the development of ecotourism. Small scale, small businesses <clears throat> specializing in guiding scientists and filmmakers into remote zones sprouted after these documentaries. Uh, we know that such things will always come out. There'll be always this guy who say, I can show you around this forest. I was born here. Um, you know, oh, I can you know, oh, I can do this and this. And remember, all this happens just within that local yeah, whereby you're sure that the beneficiaries are just local, they're just the local guys from the entire who are doing something for themselves. And that became a very, very acceptable model. And of course, slowly it started creating this niche market. So when these uh, small businesses uh, prospered, because as long as there's business and their costs are low and everything, uh, especially in, in Costa Rica and Ecuador. Costa Rica is, uh, is documented like, like the world's the best, not really the, the best place, but uh, they are sort of a number one, number one reason. So I think they are very good and also Ecuador are very good. So as these small businesses, remember also in Costa Rica, they have the rainforest, the small businesses started developing and everything. So some of people realized, oh, this can be a niche where people come to the natural areas. They live within maybe a village. They meet the people, as you're going to see in the in a video shortly. And they also contribute to the good of that place. So in many areas of the world, pioneer entrepreneurs created special field visits and studies for adult travelers, students, and volunteers. Nowadays, we have uh, a lot of these volunteers. Uh, so you say, oh, uh, I would like to volunteer to go and work for two weeks in a natural environment in Africa. That is part of ecotourism. And when you're volunteering, you're paying. Part of that money, of course, will take care of the workers that uh, work in that particular place. But also some of that money will contribute to conservation of that place as well. We also have students who go there maybe for, for attachment uh, or internship. And the good thing about ecotourism, we're just there within the people, living there, living with them, probably and doing uh, some of the things that they are doing. Now, so international nature-based businesses began to thrive in the 80s. Uh, with growing interest in outdoor travel and the environment. Um, then, of course, these uh, companies realized that they could take initiative and conserve the environment by sponsoring local conservation groups in destinations they visited 
or by raising funds for local causes, especially to a company that source for the, for the, there has to be a company probably that is sourcing for the visitors. Maybe it's connected with the uh, visitors from Europe, from the US, from Asia. So, and of course, when the visitors come, mostly they'll pay through them. So what happens, the two companies started talking to these small local businesses and they started saying, how can we support these people? So that uh, we can also continue enjoying whatever it is that they are offering, okay? We can continue to, to make money also because also our businesses revolve around whatever, whatever these people are doing. So they started, these two companies started fundraising to support conservation. Then from there, we went to training and hiring local people, important. When you're doing uh, ecotourism, hire local people, let local people run the show. They know best, teach them. You, you need to train them, go ahead and, and train them and teach them, okay? Uh, so that at the end of the day, you are making sure that they are the greatest beneficiaries. After all, the resources are theirs because that's where they live. So I think this was a good move. Now, two operators selling trips, for example, to the Galapagos Island. Last week, we looked at, we mentioned Galapagos. Uh, Costa Rica, Kenya, and Nepal are some of the early players in this movement. So you can see Kenya, Kenya does not get left behind. Somehow, somehow, she raises her head and says, I'm there. Yeah, so, uh, so two operators are already selling ecotourism as a special uh, destination. Uh, and of course they go ahead and say where you will live and how to be and that kind of thing. Now, some of these companies argue that in fact, that they're using ecotourism principles for some 20 to 30 years. Uh, but we don't know this. Now, this is everybody trying to to say, oh, we are the ones who discovered ecotourism. I want you to look at that picture. What do you see? So this is open. I want to hear from you. What are you seeing in that picture? Oh, I'm not talking about my gym. Nothing. Yeah, I think for people. Uh, just speak a bit loudly. I'm saying I'm seeing only four people. Sorry? I'm seeing four people. I'm okay, you are seeing four people. Who else is seeing more than four people? What else are you seeing? What can you decipher from the picture? Can you tell a story from that picture? Okay, from what I can see, this is like a, a conservation area with the demarcated uh, walking paths to that uh, people can come and enjoy nature at its best. Thank you. Somebody else, apart from what Peter can see and what Clifford can see. What else are you seeing? What can you read? What story can you tell from that picture? Just think of some of the definitions we've talked about of ecotourism. Okay, I think to add on it, this guy with a blue t-shirt looks like a, a local guide who knows the, the area very well. You can see he is carrying a bucket. I don't know uh, all the purpose of the bucket, but uh, it seems he's a, he's a local guide. He's a local guide. That is true. That's very important for ecotourism. Why is it? Is it what is in the bucket? Uh, 
I can see some smoke. So most of the ancient communities used to, to do incest and, uh, and they also used to, there were, there were this tree that produces perfumes. I think uh, this is one of them. Okay, so you think he's, he's going to produce perfumes? What else? Why, why is he carrying smoke? Joy Alice. Joy Alice, are we together? Okay, Joy Alice left a long time ago. Mwandiwa, Mudegi. Thank you. Okay. I don't, I don't know. You don't know. You can't guess. You know, I don't like the answer. I don't know. I like, let me guess. Let me think. Okay, let me try it for them. Try, Derek. Verify, verify to my biology back in high school. Smoke produces carbon. Carbon, uh, carbon is used by trees for respiration. <laughs> okay. I can also try. Okay, try, come on. Uh, so uh, looking at it, this is uh, a uh, move, um, a forest. And um, from where I come from, uh, I've seen smoke being used uh, in Biri, beekeeping that is. Uh, during um, honey harvesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's a possibility that they could be, he's taking them to a beehive and he's showing them maybe their beehive so they have to carry smoke to deter the, the, the bees. Uh, I was also thinking that maybe the, the smoke also is to keep their attempts. You have very, very funny insects that come biting you as you walk through a forest. Maybe, I don't know, in that forest you have such a, such a thing. Uh, somebody else has, said, uh, has just said that is to keep wild animals a way to avoid the human wildlife conflict. Maybe, I'm trying to wonder which animals will keep away from smoke. Most animals don't like smoke, they don't like fire. So we don't know, but I'm trying to imagine in this place where they, were, they already have a pathway, probably it's not as wild, but of course we don't know. So that's also another possibility. So the people in this picture, you can, you can see the ones behind the well dressed, they, they, they are tourists, but here we can see a walk board on which is the guy is walking with his charcoal. So, so yeah, so this is important. You can already see the nature, the, the environment issue is being addressed. Uh, these people are definitely not staying in a five-star hotel. This is nothing close to a five-star hotel. Uh, they are quite right there inside nature and they are working with the local people. They are, their guide is not sued with a good accent and, and, and important, important uh, notebooks. No, it's just a local guy carrying smoke. And this guy is afraid of getting smoke. They think they're finishing this exercise, they'll all be sm smelling smoke. If you're in a five-star hotel, you don't want anything close to smoke anywhere near me. Sorry, near you. But look at these people. They don't seem to mind. They know why they came here. They are happy that <laughs> all the smoke is going to them. Actually, the local guy is fine. Yeah, apart is smoke, but the guys behind him are just suffering. But it looks like they are, they are ready to sacrifice that to get to where they are going, whatever it is they are going to do and achieve it. So, it can be profitable, but it requires people who are ready to meet higher social and environmental goals. In short, we are saying ecotourism cannot be business as usual. You can't do it the way you do the Kawaida uh, tourism. No, you are, you are high. 
your environmental goals have to be higher than just your kawaida. Uh, and look here, you know it goes all around, right from the food you're eating, to the water you're drinking, to the places you're staying, to the things that you're doing, it all adds up. So it's calling for those people who have a conscious towards environmental conservation, uh, for them to say, yeah, I think this is the right place for me to stay, or I don't think it's, it looks good, it's glamorous, but this is no place for me to stay. They need to be able to do that. Now, uh, the fact that, okay, business owners who must be willing to apply as, there must also be business owners who are willing to apply a unique set of standards to their business approaches. Standard, these standards, we now have some standards, but they have been involved, evolving in the last 10 years. The fact that no international regulatory body exists and that standards in the field of ecotourism are quite difficult to measure has allowed businesses and governments to promote ecotourism without any oversight. Yeah, and this can be bad in one way. If everything that comes up, just because of a standard, you say, oh, this is ecotourism, and you sell it as ecotourism, of course, you know, when you sell it as ecotourism, it creates interest. Maybe you are charging higher than the rest, so you get more people. But is that really tourism? So I think what is lacking right now are the standards. Uh, the standards or even the vetting that say this is, this is an eco-tourism outfit or this outfit has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with eco-tourism. Now, eco-tourism is a business and it can be, no, 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 sorry, sorry, I thought. So we've got this term greenwashing. And what we are saying, those who want to sell ecotourism, if they don't meet the standards, are misusing this name, ecotourism. Are they making money? Yes, because once they tell people it's, eco, it's an ecology and that kind of thing, people will come. Never mind that they are not going to find what you're saying they will find. You start giving them stories. But this has also created a lot of disappointment in the, in the inside. And uh, it has also, I think, uh, made it even more urgent for there some conversations and some guidelines and rules as to how to run ecotourism. However, in some cases, the, the lack of knowledge may be the, the reason behind not people knowing whether this is ecotourism or not. So we still leave that benefit of doubt that people could genuinely attend be unaware. But I think once they are made aware, they can make right impacts. Sorry, they can make right decisions. If, uh, if it's a business owner, they can be able to upgrade. And even if it's a tourist, they know what it is they are going to do. And uh, yeah, the rules that they need to follow. Uh, international conferences, workshops, publications, however, have continued to make it more and more clear what is ecotourism yeah. and what it is not. So this has helped a bit in defamation. So what are the environmental objectives and how are they met? In order for ecotourism to have achieve, okay, I think it's a good time to Watch this video.
Can you see my screen? No. Okay. So let me try. <clears throat> let me try and share. More information, click here. We are peace. We are poor. We are how we treat each other. You can call it as you like. Green traveling, sustainable traveling, or environmental and cultural friendly traveling. Ecotourism has many different names, but they all have one similar goal. Ecotourism consists of the words ecological and tourism. A good mixture, huh? Would you like to combine them both? I guess that ecotourism fits perfectly to you then. But first we have to clarify what ecotourism actually is. There are many definitions and various concepts. According to the International Ecotourism Society, or short, TIES, ecotourism is defined as responsible travel to natural areas that conserves the environment, sustains the well-being of the local people, and involves interpretation and education. Once we have that, we can move on to the fun part. How does ecotourism look in practice? It is hard to point out what ecotourism constitutes, since every project has its own focus. But cultural exchange is a common core aspect, as well as environmental protection and preservation of biodiversity. Other concerns are livelihood improvement and the strengthening of human rights. Many villages receive support from local or foreign NGOs, and specialized staff provides knowledge and future-oriented ideas. As every ecotourism location is different, the accommodation differs as well. To name some examples, there are eco-lodges, tree houses, homestays, hammocks, or tents. Let's take a look at the advantages for communities. Economically seen, ecotourism creates jobs locally and the need for young people to leave home to work in cities is reduced. Nearly everyone can participate by being a tour guide, selling or cooking food, providing accommodations, taking part in culture performances, and more. Communities can consolidate their financial status due to entrance fees and program or accommodation costs. In addition, their earnings are stabilized since they have a diversified economy. What about those who can't get involved? Everyone profits from ecotourism because of the shared income in the community. In terms of the infrastructure, new streets and schools can be built, as well as health centers, drinking water resources, and electricity. In the best case, an ecotourism business will train local people with new skills to expand their opportunities. And what about the environment? Due to responsible tourists through the nature, ecotourism has low negative impacts on the environment. A common activity is tree planting to grow rare trees in the project's region to increase the population. The surrounding nature is protected because of the establishment of national parks, marine parks, or wildlife sanctuaries. Thanks to protected areas, biodiversity is sheltered and wild animals can remain in their natural habitat. Communities often sell their resources like water, trees, minerals, or wildlife if they don't earn enough money. In addition, forests are cut down to create farms. Ecotourism is a sustainable alternative for these problems. In many ecotourism projects, renewable energy resources, water conservation schemes, recycled material, and a safe waste disposal is used. Moreover, most participants cook with local and organic food. Concerning the culture, ecotourism projects have high standards to protect customs. The local culture is not exploited or commercialized, so that traditions and the region's heritage is preserved. Locals have the chance to present their culture with performances of customs and let you take part in it. And guess what? 
Not only do the communities benefit from it, but you do as well. It is ensured that the money you spend won't go to the sometimes corrupt governments. You know where your money goes and for what it is spent on. And there's a huge price range of ecotourism projects, so everyone can afford it. See Unspoilt Nature and learn more about the condition of the environment while trekking. As a side effect, you will find beautiful landscapes and calm and relaxing places. Take a break from the crowded and loud cities. Simultaneously, you can reduce your carbon footprint and protect the environment. Ecotourism projects are sensitive to the environment and animals, in contrast to mass tourism. Animals are not unfairly caged, so you can see them in their natural habitat. Learn more about regional plants and animals. In terms of cultural aspects, you get an authentic picture of a location and learn about their lifestyle at first hand to get a deeper understanding of their culture. Get an inside view of their prospects and desires. Sometimes you have the opportunity to sleep in villages with hosts in their homestays. Take part in activities like ceremonies, dancing, or cooking classes. Enjoy the different varieties of music and style of dress that you will be introduced to during your travels. Buy souvenirs from craft producers or even learn how to do it yourself in handicraft workshops. See the world from a different angle and get new perspectives through exchanges with the locals. By the way, did you notice the triangle of sustainability? It includes economic vitality, environmental integrity, and social equity. These three parts are always taken into account in sustainable projects. All these facets are the reason why ecotourism is such a sustainable concept and brings joy, financial security, and unforgettable moments. Let's see what tourists say. I think it's really worthwhile. I think people travel to see something different and unique, and we want to make sure that places keep their own spirit and culture, and that's part of the joy of traveling and being able to support an ecotourism project where not only the, the culture, but the nature and the uniqueness of a place um, is really great and hopefully it'll make traveling as good for our children and our future families and grandchildren as it is, as it is for us. Um, so I think that's important to keep, keep open, share the same experiences and opportunities that, that, that we've had. And who can participate in ecotourism? The answer is everyone can. You don't have to be super active since there are many projects that don't require of activities. You could travel alone, with friends, your partner, or even with children. And you don't have to spend a lot of money or stay overnight if you don't want to. Every project is different, and so are the travelers. You are responsible for the projects you choose, whether you fit into the activities and the accommodation or not. But don't forget, you get the chance to try something new and widen your horizons. Ecotourism gives different view of the world and challenges us to open our minds to different ways of thinking. The concept of ecotourism includes great possibilities and provides positive experiences for both visitor and local. It builds environmental and cultural awareness and respect. It's up to you. Travel green and have unforgettable experiences. Encourage others to take care while traveling and raise awareness about the culture, the people, their history, and the environment. Inform yourself about ecotourism for places you want to visit. They are all over the world. What are you waiting for? There are so many. Okay. Back to class. Uh, I hope you, you have learned a thing or two from that uh, book. I think because uh, I thought it also have some, some of the things, some of the features that we are looking for, the, the good definition of ecotourism, the sustainability of, of ecotourism that is not just for today's generation, uh, it is also for future generations. So that is, that is very, very important for ecotourism. So let's continue with... Um, Yeah. So meeting environmental objectives. In order for ecotourism to achieve its key social and environmental objectives, it, is re it requires that there should be, one, a specialized marketing 
to attract travelers who are primarily interested in visiting natural areas. As we saw, not everybody is interested in traveling to natural areas. People have all sorts of interests. So you have, if you are marketing ecotourism, you want to promote ecotourism, then you've got to have that very specialized uh, ecotourism. So that specialized marketing will really, really attract the potential us. Then uh, management skills that are particular to handling visitors in protected natural areas. When people are visiting protected natural areas, there are so many rules at times, a lot of do's and don'ts. So uh, you need a lot of skills in order to guide your, your visitors so that they'll go, they'll enjoy the place and leave the place more or less the way they found it. Uh, things like no littering. Uh, if they are, probably they have some paths where you, you walk through, you don't walk all over, you have to follow a certain path. You don't know, go removing uh, branches or leaves from trees or taking away animals uh, or insects, or whatever it is. So you, you need very specialized skills, management skills to be able to handle this. Interpretation services should preferably be managed by local inhabitants. Because remember, uh, you are living among them they know the area better than any other visitor. And that resource is theirs. So they know the history of the place. And they are the best. If you train them properly, they are the best ones. So you don't need to bring tour guides from wherever. Those ones, train the locals, teach them how to do it. Even if at times they have to do it through an interpreter. That is still fine, it is acceptable. If, for example, you want to tell the history of a place and the only person who can tell it, well, is an old man using a local language, tell the story, just have an interpreter. So that in all cases, the local economy and the local people and their capacity is also built. So, this is, I think this is a natural forest. I think it's somewhere in Rwanda. Yeah, I just found that bridge really interesting. And I was wondering, would I want to, would I want to use that bridge? So that is just a break, huh? a break. Uh, another, issue is that government policies that earmark fees from tourism to generate funds for both conservation of wildlands and sustainable development of local communities and indigenous people. So the government must always have in mind that whatever is coming out from, from this kind of ecotourism should be able to support conservation, but also the sustainable development of local people. Some money should go back to those communities. The government should not take everything. So they make sure they are continually investing, maybe supporting education, maybe supporting health, maybe a community project. So the government should always, some of those proceeds have to be plowed back into the community. Then it should also be focused, focus attention on local people who must give the right of prior informed consent. Uh, if you want to start an ecotourism project or, or enterprise, for heaven's sake, involve the, right, the, 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 the local people and give them the right to either agree or refuse. Okay, that is what you call full participation. Let them decide. Tell them your proposal, tell them what you want, put everything on the table, Educate them on everything, then let them decide if they want to continue or they don't. If they don't, then, then let it be. Don't force them. Okay. And so let's look at the principles of ecotourism. I think we looked a bit before, but let's look at them again. So one of the principles is to minimize the negative impact on nature and culture 
that can damage a destination. So you want the footprint to be very, very small on both the culture and also the environment. Then you should also educate the traveler on the importance of conservation. So as I said before, the traveler must be educated. And then uh, you should stress on the importance of responsible business, which works cooperatively with local authorities and people so that the local needs can be met as well as deliver the conservation benefits. Uh, then there are direct benefits to conservation and management of natural land and protected areas. That's what I was saying that some of these processes should go directly to protection and management. And then emphasize the need for regional tourism zoning and for visitor management plans designed for either regions or natural areas that are slated to become eco destination. How are you going to zone your, your region? What about visitor management? How are you going to do it? So this has to be thought through and be well planned. Then also another principle is to emphasize the use of environmental and social baseline studies, as well as long-term monitoring programs to assess and minimize impact. So as you continue carrying out your business, you should have in place monitoring programs. Of course, you have your baseline, okay. So 10 years down the line, how is the social fabric? Is it better or worse or it, it is as it was during baseline? What about the environment? And this, this monitoring helps you to assess the impact. And it also helps you to intervene fast enough to minimize this impact, especially if they are negative. Then, you should also strive to maximize, another principle, you should strive to maximize economic benefit for host and communities, particularly people living in and adjusting to natural area and protected areas. I think that's already clear. You should also seek to ensure that tourism development does not exceed the social and environmental limits of acceptable change as determined by recent cooperation with local residents. The thing is, how much change can society tolerate? Okay, do they want to reach a point where there's so much change addressing like uh, tourists, for example, is a community ready for that? For some, I think it's religion. For some, I think it's whatever culture it is. How much is the community ready to tolerate and how much are they not ready to tolerate? So you should always work together. Then you should also, another principle is rely on infrastructure that has been developed in, in harmony with the environment. Some infrastructure actually is so environmentally friendly. And I think once you start ecotourism, you should sustain it. For example, minimize the use of fossil fuels uh, in a place like Lamu. Okay, we later on are going to look at heritage sites. Uh, if you go to Lamu, I think now there's, there's, there's a tractor, there's a rain, Land Rover. I think there's one at that car. Of course, there are many, many motorbikes now, which is a nuisance. In Lamu, before you never see a motorbike, there was only one tractor. No fossil fuel users at all. And uh, that was it. And the, the residents were happy to use donkeys. Of course, they keep pooping everywhere. And it's just that distinct smell in Lamu, which at times is intolerable. <laughs> but well, that is what they want. They didn't want cars. But now with the advent of, of motorbikes, motorbikes have become a nuisance, especially in those narrow streets. You can easily get down, knocked down. So that's, that's what I'm saying. You have to think through these things. Uh, do you want to conserve local plants? Maybe even the local people don't want any introduction of any other plant from elsewhere. They want to maintain their local plants, their local wildlife. 
and all that kind of stuff. So, who are the ecosystem stakeholders? Who are those people? Washikadao. So one of the stakeholders is the government. So what should the role of the government be? The government should guarantee the protection of nature, local cultures, and especially traditional knowledge, and also genetic resources. So that is the role of the government. They should come up with policies to make sure that all these are taken care of. So the second thing that the government should do, especially the ministries of tourism, is to develop policies that will protect and manage natural areas, very specific to natural areas. So that even tomorrow, if somebody wants to start an ecotourism project in a certain area, they already have some guidelines on the do's and don'ts and also the requirements and that kind of thing. Uh, tourism boards and ministries should establish brand recognition of the country as an ecotourism destination. Let me finish this and then I'll show you video on Kenya. Uh, the government should also sustain development of regional networks and cooperation and marketing of ecotourism products at the international and regional level. I think the government does this a lot, just promoting. But I don't know whether there is the, the Kawaida tourism. I don't know how much they target ecotourism. I'm not sure. Uh, but we, we'll, we'll find out. Then there's the development of stable infrastructure, currency exchange rates, which should be friendly, transport system, of course, peace and security. You know, for example, that tourism in Kenya started collapsing after the 1997-98 tribal class. It's a short one. Can you see that? It's famous. Can you see that? Hello? Yes. Fine. One of One the most, most diverse, diverse ecosystems, ecosystems in the, in the world. world. Its, it's large wildlife wild wild reserves and unique landscapes has made it an extremely popular, popular destination for tourism, tourism breaking, breaking in millions, millions of earnings, earnings every year. year. And now the and trend, the trend in, the in the sector is to be eco-friendly, eco a stance that has seen ecotourism take a central focus. Ecotourism is an issue, a situation where there is environmental conservation. There is responsible, responsible use, use of resources, resources and, and also, also social, social, in, uh, social, social in, uh, economic, economic investment is involved. Ecotourism Eco essentially has, has three aspects, aspects to, it. to it. First of all, First of all it, protects it protects the environment, the environment and, and conserves the wildlife habitat. Secondly, it pays special, special attention to, to the, the aspirations of communities so that the local communities can benefit from tourism. And thirdly, it offers a different kind of experience to the visitor, where they're getting close to nature and enjoying being very uh, close to wildlife and able to enjoy learning more about the, uh, the habitat and the environment and the different animals they see with high quality guides.
Ecotourism attempts to give back to the country what has been taken from it. This also means that travelers actively engage in promoting the culture and environment of Kenya. Ecotourism and, and, and indeed sustainable tourism actually looks at um, having a cohesive relationship between what we would um, traditionally call tourism facilities and the communities that surround them. And then the understanding just, it, it, it's, it's, it's a natural process, the understanding of, of the codependence of the, the, the tourism facilities and the, the communities. With the effects of climate change already being felt across the world, the tourism industry has been blamed for wasteful and intrusive practices. Deforestation is a major factor in climate change. And it's very important that we conserve our forests. And of course, tourism and ecotourism has a role to play because conservation of the environment, uh, the wildlife parks, uh, and the protection of forests are vital for tourism. And so what you'll find is that by encouraging ecotourism, making it possible for people to earn an income from tourism means that there's a greater, uh, a greater incentive for protecting the forests. And we found that uh, wildlife parks and the establishment of wildlife conservancies has an important role to play in uh, stopping the destruction of forests. However, Kenya is seeing a reverse of this trend and already the country has won many accolades on the international stage. Recently in China, it was announced that Kenya was voted in the top five destinations in the world for our Maasai Mara Reserve, which of course has become world famous. And then also uh, in China, again, the World Traveller Award for the best ecotourism destination in the world was won by Kenya. These types of awards are, are looking to reward those who are making um, significant investment in promoting sustainability and Kenya is one of them. And I think that's, that has begun to have a lot more relevance in local media and issues surrounding aspects to do with the Mao are now being connected to um, important sectors like tourism and so that is now gaining more airtime. The development of eco-friendly facilities has been a positive step in this direction where hotels and lodges attempt to minimize their impact on the surroundings. What we have tried to do in the area we are in Massa is that we have created a company called Mara North Conservancy where we are guaranteeing a fixed payment for the land every month no matter how good or bad the tourism is and what we are hoping is that the, the, the cattle owner or the herder will now see there is an alternative only to livestock. Slowly, slowly we are working with the community to understand this and at the same time bringing in donors, bringing in other money from elsewhere, digging in our pockets once again to maybe introduce different herds, different breeds so we can, we can have a much better life with less cattle. One of the key things is improving the awareness levels of people. What is ecotourism and what, what does it aim to achieve and how sustainable is it? What, what kind of thresholds are we looking at in terms of where, we, where it can be applied? But most importantly, how does it fit into sustainable tourism and then how does this affect the uh, tourism sector overall? The future looks bright and it is expected that ecotourism in Kenya will continue to grow at a rapid pace since there is much scope for improvement.
Hello, can we continue now? Yes. Okay. So, so I think uh, we've, we've watched that clip on Kenya. We, we've seen actually Kenya does have an ecotourism board, though so Kenya is taking ecotourism seriously. And yeah, there are plans and uh, strategies, I hope, that are in place to try and promote ecotourism. There is a lot that uh, Kenya can offer in terms of ecotourism. And as you've seen, I think Kenya already won an award for, I think, the best uh, ecotourism destination. They did, but they didn't. So uh, it's up to you to find out. And even on your own, you now start thinking, uh, what can we do at the coast? Of course, I know there are some ecotourism, whatever, but what else can be done? I'm um, with this knowledge. What, what, what else do you think you can do? You don't have to start big at any one time. So the other, um, the other stakeholders are the local authorities. And in this, I would say for, for, for us, I think it's the county government. They have their responsibilities to promote ecotourism, probably also to zone out those areas that uh, they can sell and say these are possible ecotourism sites. So in case anyone is ready to invest, uh, this, is, this is a venture that you can do. Of course, you have to be in agreement with the, with the local communities. We also have NGOs that promote ecotourism. Uh, I think like the one in, I think we have some NGO in, where is this? In, uh, oh no, I think that is now fully under the Kipepeo project. I think that is now under the community, fully under the community, I'm not sure. Then we've got the private sector, of course, where you get most of the, of the investors. And then we've got communities which are very important stakeholders of ecotourism. Uh, some of the negative socioeconomic and cultural impacts of tourism include, we discussed this in the last, uh, uh, in the last lecture last week, but let's just remind ourselves there's of course the loss of local traditions uh, then there is commercialization of local cultural projects. Maybe what was once uh, uh, available for communal use, uh, when the demand goes high, then even that which the community could access without, uh, without pay, then uh, people start charging for that. So you commercialize everything. Uh, I, I always remember right outside my house, not, yeah, not far from my house, just a few meters from my house, is a small tree. I don't know that it's a tree. Well, it's a tree. So this tree is called the Birimbi tree. And it, it bears some fruit which grow even on the stem. And these fruits, are, they are very good for making sauces making a chili sauce or any other sauce. Uh, this tree, anybody in the village can come and get some birimbis. Nobody will ever charge you for it, even if it's not on your plot. You just entitled the fact that you are a local, you live there, not, yeah, you live there, then you're entitled. Uh, and I always say the moment that somebody will start thinking that they can take these ones to the market and say, of course, I've seen them being sold in the market. The moment or the day that somebody will think of doing that, then that will be the end of free taking. People will start charging for it. And it happens a lot with other local cultural products in wherever it is. Once tourism comes in, I'm talking about the Kawaida tourism, then these things become commercialized and all that part of the social fabric is then there's erosion of self self worth. I've seen we've I think we've seen a lot of this where 
even young people, even older people just throw themselves at tourists, at tourists. They forget who they are, they forget their dignity and are ready to do anything, just anything to earn a few dollars or a few euros and that kind of thing. Then there is also the undermining of family structure. Uh, I think we have, we have experienced this a lot at the coast, especially I think in the 90s and before. Uh, 90s, the early 2000s, where we had a lot of tourists at the coast. And what used to happen in, of course, not all the, the hotel workers, in some hotel workers, uh, I heard this story so many times, and so I, I believe that it has some weight in it. It happened, whereby even a man and a woman, maybe a young family, would agree and say, okay, maybe the woman would tell the man, oh, just see whether you can get a mzungu, or the wife, it would be the other way around. And uh, this was, the aim was to improve their economic status. So probably the man would go and get a Mzungu girlfriend at the hotel, befriend one, they become friends, they'll be brought home. When they come home, the wife is either told to leave or yeah, or he say, oh, this is my auntie, my wife left. So the Mzungu wife thinks, so oh, the auntie is helping take care of the kids. And of course, uh, on the other side, then he, they, they get the financial support or, or that kind of thing. Of course, the time they had to travel out of the country, that was also good at that time. So what happened is that the family structure was seriously, seriously undermined. Uh, I hope those things stopped dreaming really, and with the, with the collapsing of, of the tourism industry. But those are some of the things I'm talking about that a family is no longer uh, protected. And there, there are so many, the boundaries really are ne ne neither here nor there. It depends on what is working today and what is working tomorrow. Anyway, so another uh, disadvantage is the loss of interest, especially among the youth in local land stewardship. So that just lack of responsibility among them, they don't care so much about the land anymore. Money is much more important to them. How much can I make in a day? Then of course, when it comes to, to, to uh, the benefits from tourism cash economy, remember the Kawaida economy does not necessarily focus on the, on, on the community. So if I'm lucky enough to, to get benefit good for me too bad for the rest of you and of course that brings a lot a, lot, a bit of uh, some bitterness and bad feelings between the community members and at times uh, yeah they are conflict then there is also the issue of crime and adoption of illegal underground economies to serve tourists maybe through prostitution gambling drugs all these we know they happen they happen a, a tourist has come out and care about the community they want to take drugs they want to use young girls and young boys. And there are those who will, there'll be pimps who will, who will supply all that and more. So yeah, so that some of the negative, negative effects of ecotourism. Now, uh, I want us to get into groups and I want you to discuss how local communities can participate equitably with other players in ecotourism. Remember we've said they are stakeholders, they are players, very important. So just think how can they be involved more in, in ecotourism or shaping up the ecotourism uh, ventures, economic ventures, for example, that are coming up in their locations, in their areas, wherever they are, and that kind of thing. So I think I'm going to give this 
just about 15 minutes. I hope there'll be nobody lost who I know. I don't know where I'm supposed to be. Uh -huh. So I think that's okay. I'm just opening up the rooms. Make sure you go to your group. Don't waste time. Make sure you go to your groups and let's start. Swali ni gani? Ay, o oh, watu oh, kwani kuni kuna discussion hapa Kalani Fabian Na Google
Ya, budi ya. Budi ya. Kuna zenye nimeka kwa chat okay. so Marketing, trading Then, I'm going to kama source of labor, creating information centers. of benefits that accrued from the, the ecosystem program then there must be that there must be an equal there must be a, a clear 
ratio of sharing those 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 revenue that are good from the from ecosystem program. Then another thing we found that uh, the, the the community can fully participate in the ecosystem program by list maybe listing this their land to the to the conservancies. And another another thing we found that uh, they, they can also participate through creation of the local community conservancy, which which will help the the management staff to mon to easily monitor the the local community. Then we found that uh, local community can can have equal chance by airing by 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 being be, being given a chance to air their views. That's what we have discussed. Okay, thank you very much, Group One. Let's hear from Group Two. Just mention the one. Such as through um, guides, uh, that is tour guides, uh, and this can build some sense of uh, commitment. Uh, we also have the building of just to create awareness of these um, ventures and um, finally marketing and training. Okay, thank you, group two. Group three, anything different from those two groups? Okay. I can only see one thing that is different is that the local community can be allowed to retain their not to retain the access right to their community resources to ensure that those resources are not misused to ensure protection of the resources for sustainability and continuation of enhancing the tourism. Okay, thank you. Group three, group four. Was there a group four? I think there was a group four. Two people disappeared, and I know who they are. Either they didn't meet, but there was a group with two people. Okay, we'll find out that later. Madam, we lost you. Oh, sorry. I, I was still on mute mode. Let me go back. So the basic steps to encourage community participation. So the first thing is that you should understand very clearly the role of the community. Uh, and they should be allowed to control, to exercise control over their growth and development. Then 
wherever they need technical assistance so that they can make the right decision, it should be availed to them. Then time and funds and experienced personnel should be allocated to work with communities well in advance. Not when you've set up everything, no, right from the beginning, walk with them, talk with them, agree so that at any one given time, everybody knows what is happening. And then avoid allowing communities to feel that they are powerless to influence patterns of development. Remind them again and again, if they are uncomfortable about something, then they should just go ahead and say so. And if they have a better idea about an issue, they should go ahead and voice their concern. The next issue is about empowering communities. So remember, jobs are important benefits. And, and I know most eco, 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 eco tourism ventures, they all will give you jobs and everything. That is OK. But jobs do not replace empowerment. In fact, the times when you're given a job, uh, you, you at times to some extent you need to be less powered or empowered because if you ever want to raise an issue, you are reminded, reminded hey, remember you're an employee, you could lose your job here. So employment is good, but this is not to replace empowerment. Communities must genuinely participate in the social making. And the only way you can make sure somebody is participating genuinely is to make sure that they have all the information they need to make the right decision. Don't give them half the information and hide the other half. So make sure they have all the information so that when you're on the discussion table, they, they, they are in complete, uh, they are fully aware of everything about what you're doing or what you suggest to do. Processes, but also it should also be the other way around. Processes must be initiated to ensure that communities can manage their own growth and resources wisely. Uh, as you continue, empower the community, build their community so that they can be or their own drivers of growth and development. They know where they want to go. They know what they want and what they don't want. So make sure let us empower. The other important thing is urge local project participation. In this case, project managers must identify local leaders, local organizations, key priorities of communities and ideas, expectations and concerns of the local people they already have. Get some opinion leaders, people who are respected in the community, people who are knowledgeable, and work to them, let them participate in the project. And also let them also communicate to the larger community what is happening, where are we, what is happening, and that kind of thing. And then uh, ensure that there is information, gather it uh, for the community, gather it with the community. For any information, just say, always involve the locals. Then also formulate training opportunities so that these community members can gain planning skills, for example, entrepreneurial skills that are required to run small businesses. So don't just bring people from outside to do all this. Build the local people, build their capacity to be able to do this. Then the other one is create stakeholders. So, and in this case, just say you can decide participation even from individuals and also for local organizations. Uh, investment in project development areas should be encouraged either in cash, labor, or in kind. Encourage local investors. Do you want to start this kind of business? Do you want to do this kind of thing? And encourage the local people to do some of these things. Then develop lodging by local entrepreneurs and setting standards for local services by local organizations are two good examples. Again, remember in ecotourism, in most cases, the tourists will definitely, in most cases, be staying within the village. So can we encourage the local people to go ahead and, 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 and invest in this? Then there has to be links to conservation, sorry, link benefits to conservation. 
So whatever you are benefiting it, how much are you plowing back into conservation? Distribute the benefits, there's one, okay, I think most of the groups talked about equitable distribution of benefits, identify the community leaders, bring about the change that they want to see, don't keep promising it, bring it about, understand the site specific conditions, understand. Whereas this model has worked in another area, maybe for this area, because of the conditions, it may not work. So what shall we do? And of course, as always, monitor and evaluate the progress. What is, let's look at community-based conservation. Uh, Community-based conservation may be defined as any voluntary in initiative of natural resources or biodiversity production conducted for, by, and with local community. So the aim is to enhance wildlife or biodiversity conservation, but also to provide incentives for the local people. And these incentives, in most cases, they are economic. Uh, Community-based conservation can thus encompass so many initiatives with different aims, governance systems, local decision-making power, all these core management conservation, like what we have at the coast, the Tengefus, the Community Forest Association, all those are community-based uh, conservation initiatives. Uh, in self-regulated initiatives, management authority and responsibility rest with the rural community or the indigenous people. This is their show. They do it according to their rules. That is a self-regulated initiative, mostly with no help from outside. But in co-managed initiatives, just want to highlight in co-managed initiatives, international and national agencies uh, and non-government organizations, etc., promote community-based conservation by involving local people in decision making around natural resource management. I also want to say that in common age initiatives, in most cases, the government is involved. And we know for our, the fisheries, in BMUs, in the Tengefus, in Community Forest Association, actually it's not the NGOs or all those, it's the government and the people that are involved in conservation and whatever other initiatives there. Of course, there are other initiatives where NGOs work together with communities. Uh, these initiatives are sometimes developed to respond to the failure of top-down conservation models, especially like in the forest uh, sector. And that is why they came up with co-management, where you work together with communities to manage, as opposed to where it was just the government going around and telling people, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. Now they work together with the community. So what's the importance of involving community in conservation practices? Why should we involve them? One of the reasons they enforce, enforcing regulations becomes less costly because you're working with them. Then you also benefit from local knowledge, which is very important. You enhance sustainability. You're building the capacity of the local people. You are sharing responsibility. You are accelerating change a social cohesion between stakeholders because they look at the resource as theirs, not as a government. It's an issue of building trust, especially between the government and the communities. There's also economies of scale. When you cut down on your cost, you are able to benefit more. So I think before, uh, I think allow me to finish this. I know it's been long, but let's look at community-based, sorry. community-based ecotourism. So these are popular means of supporting biodiversity conservation. And the most important thing about community-based ecotourism is that it links conservation to local livelihoods, preserving biodiversity, reducing poverty, and all that. Uh, community-based ecotourism 
is a tool mostly for biodiversity conservation. So that is one, it's not the only thing, but it is a tool for biodiversity conservation. And conservation organizations mostly would fund such an initiative. And uh, the premise is that ecotourism depends on maintaining attractive natural landscapes, rich flora, fauna, etc. So if you can provide an incentive to the community to conserve these, then number one, you'll already achieve one goal of attracting uh, tourists, but also you'll be able to conserve your biodiversity. CBET also is important for poverty reduction and economic development. So uh, it's been seen that uh, overall, projects, uh, CBET projects produce the best modest cash benefit. So it's not, they're not making so much money, but, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the experience today is that most CBT produce modest cash benefits, and these are oft often captured by a relatively small proportion of the community. But ecotourism can generate support for conservation among communities, as long as they can see some benefits or maintain the hope of doing so. And if it does not threaten or interfere with their main source of livelihood, this is actually the main thing when it comes to, to the com any community-based initiative. The first thing they are like, okay, what do you want to do? Is it going to affect, for example, its fisheries? Are they, is it going to affect the areas we are fishing? And the moment you start saying yes, then that's the time you start parting ways with them. So you have to be very, very careful. Number one, how you sell your, your pro model and how you plan to sustain that model. A CBT, CBT is an incentive for conservation. I think that one we've already discussed it. Uh, I don't think there's even anything new to say about it. That is, uh, it's already discussed. So, we are looking at what is the sustainability of community-based uh, ecotourism projects. The sustainability of CBT is expected to come from three sources. Number one, an ongoing conservation incentive in form of income dependent on biodiversity. For example, it's a park of people coming to see wildlife. Okay. The second source is reinvestment of some of the income to maintain the business and protect the biodiversity asset base, thereby eliminating or at least reducing the need for external funding. If you're making good money, then you can be able to reinvest that money. Instead of asking for donation and funding all the time, then and once, if, if this is continuous, then your CBT is going to be very, very sustainable. Then uh, the other source is once the basis has been established, that is community awareness, basic infrastructure, the entry of the private sector to provide the capital for further development and expansion has already been set. You, you prepare, you now open the doors for the private sector and that's another source of funding and sustainability. All these three, the, 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 the conservation incentive, the reinvestment, and this opening door for the private sector, they depend on a degree of financial success that at times is, is hard to achieve. So you really have to work very, very, very hard. So let's look at community-based ecotourism versus conservation priorities. And I think this one, this one we are going to discuss it, but I hope you get time to discuss it for that as a class. So protecting a wide range of ecosystems uh, and I coral reefs, African savannas, many of these, these places are rich in biodiversity, but um, some places are not suited for ecotourism development because of factors such as difficulty to access, elusive wildlife, uncomfortable climates, basically like in the desert, vulnerability to damage and that kind of thing. So, for example, enthusiasts who seek out the mountain gorilla or the forest canopy walls might be willing to pay more than the average safari van tourist, but they rarely generate revenue on a scale to provide an effect.
effective incentive for conservation in areas where there is strong pressure on land and biological resources. So some mind, um, it's sobering. At times, even if a place is so sweeted for ecotourism, then ecotourism might actually not take place just because of some of these issues, like this, the land is under pressure, and so are the biological resources. And at times, the other the things that are putting the land under pressures, pressure might win. And of course, there goes the opportunity for conservation or for a community-based uh, ecotourism.